Let me introduce today's subjects. Uh, usually the subject needs no introduction because he is or she is uh, known to those who might be viewing. But in this instance, we're remembering a member of the Cornell Law School family, uh, Harry Bittner, and we're fortunate to have with us his daughter, uh, Lorraine, and her husband, Richard, and her, his grandson, Andrew. Uh, and so we'll be talking with together about Harry and his time at Cornell and before and after with the three Gildens. Uh, I'll begin, Lorraine, by asking um, about Harry's time before Cornell, as, as such as you remember it. Uh, in other words, as I look at his professional history, it would have meant for you as a, as a, as a child a fair amount of movement. A lot of movement. So would you describe uh, um, well, that path? To go back, they, my parents are from Kansas City, Missouri. Right. And in 1946, they went to Philadelphia. He was, I think, reference librarian at Penn, very short amount of time. One and, year. Right. And then they moved to New York City, and he was assistant law librarian at Columbia. And that's where I was born. And I guess the first thing I remember was when he actually was finally going to leave Columbia. He was going to the Department of Justice. My mother having to uh, pack all the books. I mean, I couldn't have been more than about four or five, I guess, at that time. And then it fell through. I don't remember why it fell through. So all the books had to go back up on. And this was floor to ceiling, whole wall of books. She had to put them back. And then, then it went through again, and we moved to DC. Um, we were, he was at the Department of Justice from about 54 to 57, short amount of time, and then we moved again to New Haven. So it was a lot of moving. You know, I, I, when I tell people what my father did, I say sometimes it sounds like he was in the Army because he moved around so much. Um, and then longest stint, stint, for me anyway, was when he was at Yale because he was there from 57 to 65. And he, I but graduated. in fact, his longest stint was here at Cornell. Yes, Long up to that, that, right. Yeah, that's right. But um, 65, he came to Cornell, and I went off to college. So we, we all left Connecticut at the same time. Well, I, I went, to, I went to New, I went to school in New London. So, but we left Hampton, New Haven, at the now, same time. I'm, I'm imagining that you were old enough at the time to have some sense of what prompted him to leave his post at Yale. And oh, come, I know exactly why and, he left and, his post at Yale. And come to Cornell. Well, there are two reasons why he kind of left any place, was that he loved to come in and fix a library, bring it up to date for those standards. I mean, it was pre-computers and everything, but whatever the most modern, the, the way the library should be, at that time, the most modern it could be. And once he did that, he kind of got a little bored. But the real reason I think he was ready to leave Yale was that Yale would not make him a full professor. He was a law librarian. He didn't teach a class the way he did here, but they still would not make him a uh, full professor. And it, by that point, you know, he had a lot of stature in the whole profession. And they weren't about to do it. So I guess the timing was such that when Cornell came, you know, came asking, he was ready. Well, Cornell also had plenty to fix. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, at that point, uh, and he knew it, uh, as I understand it. He had done wi with his boss and colleague at Columbia, he'd done Miles a study. Price. Yeah, Miles Price. He had done a study of mm -hmm. the law library here. Um, did, were, were you conscious of that at all? No, no. he's coming up here. No, no. 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 So he, he, you went off to college. Right. And they came up here. They came up here. And they were here till, uh, see, what year? Do you remember what year? They were, he retired in 76. 76. Okay, because that's when our, da our daughter was born, 76. And um, he, they moved down, because I'm an only child. At that time, there was only one grandchild. And so they, he moved down, they moved down to New Jersey. Um, and he went to work for Fred B. Rothman and Company Law Book Dealers. Now, my father, my parents, and Fred and, and Dot Rothman had been friends for years. 
Fred for years had been trying to get my father to come work for him. And my father always said no because he was afraid that that would be the end of the friendship. Fred Rothman was a very strong personality. But now he was kind of finished, you know, there, there were no more law schools for him. So he went to work for Fred and it was, everything was fine. And then Fred was moving the business out to Denver and my parents said that no, they weren't going. Um, so they were staying in, they stayed in Hackensack and for a short while he commuted into Columbia and he was, um, I, was he ref he was doing reference, reference library again for, yeah. for, yeah. for a short time, work. yeah, for a short time at Columbia. Yeah. And then it just got to be, you know, yeah. the commute, it was just too much yeah. and got, he retired. Okay. So it was a lot of, uh, they moved a lot, you know, and I kind of moved a lot as a child too. And did he ever um, take you or your mom on a uh, professional trips oh. in other words uh, importantly during during his time as um, as president of the National Association he established the first physical presence of the association the headquarters in in Chicago were you ever oh yeah part of that? those are our vacations my father never took a vacation <laughs> he wasn't interested so for my mother and, and myself going to the conventions, it was our vacation. We went to San Francisco. We went to Mackinac Island up in the Straits of, of Michigan. We went to St. Louis, and that was the year he was president of the association. Went to Seattle? That was after the oh, San Francisco, okay. yeah. But we'd been in Chicago before Mackinac. There was a pre-something. I actually didn't know about the headquarters part, and it's only really since he passed away that I've kind of learned what his role was in the whole association and making it a profession. Um, apparently bef when he started, he, he went to law school and he went to library school. He never had any intention of being a practicing lawyer. He wanted, he, he wanted to be the law librarian. And at that time, if a lot of the law librarians, quote unquote law librarians, they didn't, never mind not having a law degree, they didn't have library degrees. And so one of his goals was to really make it a true profession, with, you know, that they were trained, that they had the background and everything. So I, that's something I really just recently so lost. That, that, that was a generational shift mm -hmm. and a very important one. He was the first professionally trained librarian to come to Cornell. Right. His predecessor had simply been a member of the faculty who was sort of this is yeah. a side job, right? right? Yeah. Um, but he, his yeah. goal was to make it a true profession where law librarians at least at least had a library degree, you know, and hopefully a law degree also. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, were you were you conscious of his uh, his writing? That is to say, uh, he he. With with Miles Price, he completed yeah. this effective legal research. seminal book on effective legal research, right. uh, published in '53, right. uh, and then in successive editions. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I was aware of it. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. I quite honestly, I was five years old when that one came out. So I don't really, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I yeah. I was busy with going to nursery yeah. school and things like that. So well, some people bring that kind of project home, and so spread it out on the dining room table. Well, we did. Yeah, yeah. But, all right. I mean, the one thing I, I, I'll say it now is the abiding love of my father's life, and my mother knew it, I know it, and we're not annoyed about it, was being a law librarian. Mm -hmm. It was the main thing in his life. You know, and he, he loved it. You know, he loved every minute of it. He loved doing his projects. It's anything to do with library was a project. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, he, he was... I remember him coming home with the old file cards, mm -hmm. you know, and whatever was he, whatever project working with those file cards. So yes, he did bring the stuff home. So I assume he brought the the book too. <laughs> right. Well, Richard, can I shift to you sure. briefly? Um, you you came to know Lorraine because you were a law student here at Cornell. I I certainly was. And uh, she was off somewhere in college, but she must have. No, 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 no. She she had graduated from college, right. and she decided she wasn't. I sh shouldn't speak for her, but yeah. I think I know the story. <laughs> uh, she was undecided what she wanted to do career-wise, and having been, 
call a library brat. Uh, she decided to take a break and she worked up at Olin. Um, I was the assistant to the curator of the Wasson Collection, which is the Far East and Southeast Asian Collection, which is funny because, oh, I forget what his name was, Dick? Do you know what? No, yeah, anyway. he had two buses by the name. Yeah, <laughs> um, he had been an undergraduate at Columbia and as an undergraduate had worked, you know, for my father in the law library. So it had come full circle. Hmm. So the, the law library essentially made my life <coughs> mm -hmm. because um, I first saw Lorraine waiting for her dad. Um, I was on Law Review and at that time we had these luxurious, spacious accommodations which no longer exist. Uh, and I'd walk through the library and there would be this beautiful woman sitting there <laughs> at the end of the, the, end of the desk uh, waiting for her dad to go home. Um, and uh, we were actually introduced through a, a childhood friend of mine who, who was a um, High school, and uh, high school and college friend of Lorraine's who said, "Look up this guy. He's gorgeous." No, he, she didn't say <laughs> that. <laughs> um, and she actually reached out to me, and uh, we had a, a, a whirlwind romance. Um, lasted um, about four months or three months before I proposed, and two we were two months. Two months. I was fast. Uh, that was forty-six years ago. Uh, and then we were married at Annabelle Taylor um, later that year. Uh, August. Yeah, August. And had our re uh, wedding reception at the Statler. Right, the former Statler. But I was, you know, Harry's, I was a student of Harry's, obviously, b before I met Lorraine. Right. Um, so could you, you talk about Harry? I mean, sure. as, 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 as a teacher of uh, the process of legal research. Right, I, it, it, it was, at the time, like every law student, um, I was a little jaded, and we had this fellow standing up and sure showing us books. books, different colors of books, uh, explaining it and sending us off to the library, which we dutifully did. We had uh, lots of exercises. Lots of exercises. And, um, you know, I had other courses with, you know, a little higher priority in the sense of they had more credits and uh, blah, blah, blah. But my summer associate um, experience showed me the worth of his course. Um, I was at a law firm with uh, f you know, second year students from Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and NYU. And we were given assignments and they were lost. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just came back like a flash of memory. Everything that he taught us about research was fruitful. And uh, thanks to him, I got an offer back and a long career. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it was amazing how little those other students knew because they were never taught anything. It was not part of the, there wasn't a, someone who actually taught them the theory and how research was conducted and all those practical things. You, know, you, you come out of law school, sometimes you say, I never use any of this that I used. Mm -hmm. It was, now, yeah. now the world yeah, has that, changed a little that bit. That book he did with Price <laughs> was, of course, um, uh, quite a step beyond the prior generation of yes. books about how to do legal research, because those were more about, the, those are more bibliographic. In other words, here's right. this kind of book, and here's the history of this kind of book. Uh, and so far as I know, it was the first book that said, all right, here's how you use these. Okay, absolutely. This is, this is the process. And everyone yeah. used it. It was, a, it was like a Bible. Well, Still do. Yeah. <laughs> well, but was it Bill Babiskin? He said the same thing. After yeah. his, he went to someplace in Boston, he was had fellow Harvard. He had there were other um, right, right, right. Uh, summer interns from Harvard, and he said the same exact thing. He came back and he said, "I knew so much more than the Harvard students." Right, right. A Andrew still. And, and Andrew, let me turn to you. Yeah. You you have taught legal research. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so this this uh, my father's story about. Uh, 
um, students kept having a leg up because they embraced legal research really resonates with um, my, so I, I taught legal research at Stanford for four years and um, one of the major pitches was you're going to be competing with students from that's trash Yale and Harvard because <laughs> um, that, and that being able to do that to to really understand the processes of how to do good legal research will help you with your jobs, will help get you ahead, will make you really stick out. Um, and students seem to appreciate that now um, more than ever. And um, you know, even in a time where everything is digital and um, you know, an, an algorithm seems to give an answer to any question you, you might have, the wisdom that was in effective legal research um, is still behind all these systems that um, behind Westlaw, behind Lexis, and um, one of the major parts of teaching the research t today is to show that the processes that my grandfather um, published and popularized are underlies all of the tools we have today, and it still is how you go. If you want to answer a question, you start with those treatises. You move from there into the primary materials, and then you shepherdize key site from there. It's the same, the same processes, even though the tools are flashier and um, and in your pocket now. <laughs> we have talked about this. We thought my father would have loved going into the computer part of it. You know, it was just a little bit yeah. starting at, at the end, but I think he would have well, been it first fascinated by itself it. into libraries um, as a tool for librarians. Right. Um, so that uh, I don't, and, and I don't know that trajectory well enough to know whether it would have, but certainly with his interest in bibliography and his assembling, I mean, he, he created what ended up being called, he called the technical services unit within this library, which had, was involved in acquisitions and cataloging. And the first presence of the computer in that whole piece of library business was to mean that every law school didn't have to do its own cataloging. Um, your father also led the reorganization of the law books within the Cornell Law Library mm -hmm. in conformance with the Law Library of Congress's K system. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, do you have any memory of that? But it no. involved a major yeah. staffing up of the library group here. And, I, I, uh, I do remember him coming to your home with the drawers from oh, yeah. and, and reshuffling all of the <laughs> He did that his whole, that's, he would, that's what I remember. He'd come and reshuffle all the cards. He said, they're not indexed right. So he, no, that, he was he manually was always doing that. Yeah. Doing that. Yeah. 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 It, you know, we, we can date Lexus from 1973, which, and I, I don't think the first terminal came into the building here. So I graduated in 71, and I believe that there was a couple of Lexus terminals that were there almost as an experiment with word searching, which, you know, I was, at that point, it was so rudimentary that it missed mm -hmm. so many things that I, I didn't particularly like using it. Now, obviously, now, <laughs> now, where I am in my career, Google suits me just fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, and but 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 what's amazing about um, that book and the wisdom that it, it has created is that um, students today think, oh, I'll just Google it; it'll provide the answers. But then that's that's actually a terrible way of going about yes, answering uh, a, a legal a legal problem. So the you know the librarians at Stanford and every school that I know of, uh, you know, when they come into the classroom. They present the the flow chart of legal research, the legal research process, and it's the same process. You're just looking um, online rather than going running around the library, and it, it's faster. But the the knowing that process is the way you become a good lawyer. But this, the main tool of the trade, while your father was uh, active, was a, were the three by five slips of cards. Yes. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, the green slips. Uh, he was. Oh, I remember those. Yeah. <laughs> I remember For those. Year, so. I mean, when I was little too, it was that yeah. was all the stuff that he was always bringing home and sitting there, 
watching a Western, but also going through all the slips. <laughs> he liked Western. So, yeah, the problem is he, he, got, he was a very intense, intense person. You don't see that in him. I, I saw uh, no, you he never was a very yeah. intense person when he concentrated something. Football, Western. baseball, and Westerns. He literally uh, had fallen out of his chair. He was so intense. It was a walker chair, and he would get so. In, he was he, fighting he would, the, he the would Westerns. He would run with the football players. He went back <laughs> over on his head several, several <laughs> so, times. It was like, he, but, and you never expect that because he's mild, so mild mannered. But when he got into a subject, he was like completely in it. And he had he, you know, for his mild mannered, you know, he was. He was home. He was perfectly happy. Leave him alone. He would sit and read philosophy books, or he was reading the, the Times. And even once he had Alzheimer's, and my mother said to me, "Well, maybe you know, he takes it, you know he's sitting there reading the Times. Maybe you know it's kind of a waste of money." I said, "Why? I mean, so it takes him all day to read the Times. It takes everybody all day to read the New York Times." Yeah, me too. And he would just sit there, and maybe he reread the same article twice. But this is something he had been, you know, he'd always done: Time. philosophy books and the New York Times. Well, he uh, retired here when you were born, Andrew. Uh, and I no, Sarah I, was born. Sarah. It was Sarah. Sarah. Sarah, Sarah was born in '76. Yeah. '76. Okay. That's when they decided to That's move when down. They decided yeah. To, to move to. And the two were, I think, probably connected, his retirement and the move. Um, um, I think once he retired... Once he retired, yeah. that was the place to be, close, yes. to, close right. to your family. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 And, of course, he retired during a period when one didn't choose to retire necessarily. Cornell had a mandatory 65 retirement. 65. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think... I mean, he, he didn't he, really retire. He went to he work went with to work, Rodman. Yes, That's right. right. And, and, and back to Columbia. Yeah. With, yeah. With Fred Rodman. yeah. But I think he, f he felt he had you know, pretty much done what he kind of set out to do here. Mm -hmm. And I guess at being almost at 65, he, he wasn't going to start all over again in another, you know, another law school. If there was an another law school that needed him or wanted I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was probably time. Yeah, it was time. Mm -hmm. It was time. And to get some good years after that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And where did they live then in the New York City? Did they lived in Hackensack, New Hackensack. Jersey. Yeah. And then uh, once you know, he, had, he had Alzheimer's. So in 19, um, 2001, in February of 2001, we moved them from Hackensack to Yonkers, New York, into an assisted living. Mm -hmm. And he only lasted about six months. This, I think this, this is a story I was telling Femi when we were up here um, for Richard's reunion. And it kind of, I think, sums up my father. Um, so he, he had Alzheimer's. Um, it was at the point where I don't think he really knew me anymore. And sometimes he knew my mother. He would say, I don't know who she is, but she's a nice person. She can stay. But then if we were visiting him, we're sitting in the living room, and he would say, somebody's in the bathroom. And we would all get nervous. And he would say, no, that's OK. He's working on a project. So that's why I say the, the all-consuming love of his life was being a law librarian. So that, even, so that even when he had Alzheimer's and didn't know who my mother was, he was still doing law projects, I, I at remember, least in his head. I remember he thought that he, he was in the library. That, that was where he, and he always had a smile on his face, even to the, la, to the last day. He and was, it was, you, you could see him thinking that he was in the law library, things, speaking about, uh, uh, about his secretaries. And yeah. he was, it was sort of like a, it was an interesting kind of reminiscence of a time that he was very happy about. Yeah, he, he was just so pleasant throughout that whole period of decline. Um, but you know, they say... Day, but he was just the sweetest man. But you know, they say sometimes when they have Alzheimer's, they, they, their personalities change, they become nasty. He didn't, he didn't become nasty. Harry Bittner became a flirt. <laughs> <laughs> he was not a flirt. He, became, he would say, oh, you look, to the nurse, the, oh, you look really great today. You know? yeah. 
Well, we're that? at the stage where I would say, yeah. is there anything that we haven't yeah. covered? Why don't we cover, because it, it's, it's sort of near and dear to our heart. After uh, Harry passed away, uh, we decided to fund a fellowship program to bring um, foreign law librarians to Cornell to learn about this wonderful institution. Um, and, and it came and out of the trip, uh, having came, came, been to Tanganyika and, and Africa and everything. Right. Did we talk about that? I forget whether we. No, talked we about mentioned he'd okay. been there. That's yeah, because you know he he was interested in creating libraries, and he, he did that in Tanganyika, now Tanzania, um, and we uh, we're actually meeting with uh, with a law librarian from Ghana who is here now. Was um, a Bittner yeah, fellow. It was a Bittner fellow. And it's very gratifying to us that the, that Femi in particular has um, latched on to this program and uh, keeps made us it one up of her, to date on and everything. And she's made that's it going one on. of her priorities. And uh, I think it's a great resource for Cornell, and it's a great resource for bringing uh, the world a little bit closer together. Um, because they've had people from all over. Well, it, it uh, tends to be more. You know, there was somebody from Chile. Ghana, it tends to be more... Uh, I thought in, uh, Japan. Japan. Or, yeah. yeah. Countries where... Where the... the, the where the there's a rule of law. Yeah. Of organization right. of a law library. Right. Not be the same. So it's, it's, it's that's, been, that's been really, really good. Um, uh, and and your, your father's experience in Tanganyika was... Um, he was also at... Um, that was at a time when there were newly independent countries mm -hmm. in Africa and elsewhere, but principally in Africa, and there was Ford Foundation money that was investing in that's what it was. It was building, a Ford Foundation building the infrastructure that had been had right. never been there mm -hmm. in the institutions of higher education. Yeah, that was, he was a Ford Foundation. Yeah. For, I, yeah. But it was, it was one of the crowning achievements in his life, I think, that he was able to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And, and, and it was uh, something he really he appreciated the importance or value of. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, he's left behind an incredible legacy here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. Uh, Andrew walked in and he said, just, he was here as a little kid, kid but yeah. to see the facility and Beautiful. Yeah. What what uh, has been built here at Cornell is it's one of the the gems of probably the legal establishment anywhere. I mean, it's hard to find a place like like this anywhere, um, even Stanford. Yes, I will, <laughs> I will definitely agree with that one. <laughs> other other reflections or reminiscences that we should uh, capture. Um. Oh, the, the story that always comes to mind, you know, he, he most people, myself included, felt he was kind of mild-mannered, you know, very easygoing and everything, but he could get, you know. So, going back to Richard's story about how he didn't quite do everything, I can't tell the story. No, my, my mother always fits into the story. Okay. Go ahead. But this is, <laughs> this, is, this is just, it really shows my father, too. Um, so, he didn't, yeah, he didn't do as well as he could have in my father's course, you know, and it was kind of, you know, if you did the work, you got the grade. Okay. So when... Did you interject? Was it pass-fail or was no, it... No, no, I, got, grade. I, I only got a B. He got a B. Right. One of the few Bs that yeah, you got. I think got. it was the only B I got okay. the first year. <laughs> so uh, when the in-laws all finally met, my mother-in-law could be very outspoken, and she looks at my father and she says, you gave my son a B. Why didn't you give him an A? And mild-mannered Harry looked her in the face and said, he didn't deserve it. <laughs> but for the most part, he was, you know, that's all you could get him really riled up. But for the most part... The, but he also became uh, a subject of, uh, of learning also. Um, uh, in Ernie Roberts' property class, uh, he loved to tell the story uh, the Bittners had uh, the built a house. Mississippi. Yeah, had built a house um, up in Triphammer, and there was a stream in the back of it, and there was a downpour. No, it was it was there was a thaw. There was a the January was a, thaw, oh, yeah. and all the water 
came into their basement. So this became an Ernie Roberts. Yeah, he called the mighty Mississippi going through <laughs> Bittner's, Bittner's, Bittner's basement, basement. Uh, and, and was the like whole it's property. Sure was no, no, it was yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was a tragedy of her mother's life. She, she took her years to tell her. She, she never told me. <laughs> so it's all, you know, all the picture, all the photographs, all this yeah. stuff that was being stored in the basement was, was right. lost. Right. So, but it became a case study for Ernie Roberts. Yes. So, a lot of yeah, a lot of uh, history there. So, well, there was one thing I wanted to ask you about his teaching of the uh, of effective legal research. Uh, did he do it all himself? Uh, that is to say, you did all these exercises. Yes. Uh, who oversaw that enterprise? He, was it he, library staff? No, or he, did? He, he did the whole thing, and, and which is, you know, we we were up here again for my reunion. And what really amazed us was the infrastructure here now and, and the number of library personnel who were, who were actually hands-on teaching. So the research librarians? Yes, right? they, were, they were, and they're amazing people. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I don't, and it's, the and law school size isn't that much bigger than, you know, maybe it's 20% bigger. Than, how many were in your class? 162, I think. Okay. So it was about 200 now? Or, Approaching 200, but then you have to say, and um, maybe close to 100 graduate students. Oh, it was much smaller at that. Yeah, that so we that's been the quantum yes. leap in size at the school since the early 90s. Yeah, yeah, the, I didn't realize yeah, that. But he that's talked, there, there's there was nobody else teaching the course, no one but, else but him. The course. Yeah. So you got all 162 of us. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of grading. But, but I mean, the whole, you know, he would be floored by the the operations here and and the and the quality of the people that that are hired in the law school it's amazing amazing yeah, and it would be amazing not, not just here but around the country how much you can his impact has um, how profound his impact has been I mean I, in the last few years you know in the in kind of the kind of law school hiring process I've met with many law librarians and you walk into their office and I'd say 70% of the time, effective legal research is still sitting there today. And it's, there's, there's these moments of like, huh, that you can really see that he has left a mark on this field uh, in pretty profound ways. And I think it make, it's not just here in, in terms right, of the wonderful right. facilities, but that his message spread to well, librarians and, and, and students. And even where his book is not on the shelf, let me say it's the template for yes. the books that are on the shelf. Yeah. Well, that was I think part of the whole. He wanted to make this a true, highly regarded profession. Yeah. 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 yeah it was. That was, it, his, that he, was his goal. He, he created the foundation, and then you know, technology went on a hyperdrive. But it's with still, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he, he was the uh, the launch platform, I'll call it. He, he uh, lives on he lives on algorithms everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, just <laughs> someone who's been in Silicon Valley way too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you for your memories of Harry Bittner. It's our pleasure.